For those on the East Coast, good afternoon. For those on the West Coast, good morning. Uh, this is Christopher Coates with Smart Growth America and Locus. Uh, if you are joining us for our trans oriented development uh, opportunities in Albuquerque, you're in the right place. Uh, we will be starting in about one minute. So uh, just a high, uh, as an FYI, we will be uh, accepting questions both through the chat box as well as uh, at our Locust Twitter handle, at Locust Developers. So we'll be starting in one minute. Again, hello. Thank you for joining our Locust webinar on TOD opportunities in Albuquerque. If you are interested in learning more about uh, walkable urban development opportunities, particularly around the historic uh, Route 66, which has currently served as the main street called Central Avenue in Albuquerque, this webinar is for you. Again, I am Christopher Coase, Vice President at Smart Group America for Real Estate Policy. Uh, where I manage a number of our real estate programs. Today, this webinar is sponsored by LOCUS. Uh, LOCUS is a national coalition of walkable urban places, uh, primarily focused on triple bottom line. Today, we will be joined by a number of local uh, elected officials and developers who will speak about the uh, real estate opportunities in Albuquerque. Today, we'll be joined by Bruce Riley, uh, who's the head of the partnership for the Greater Central Avenue. We'll also be uh, joined by Bruce Ruziri, who's the director of Albuquerque Riot, which is the local transit authority. And we'll be followed by David Blanc, who is a local real estate developer and principal of Compass Realty. Uh, for those of you <coughs> Uh, who have not participated in a webinar before, there are two objectives. LOCUS, uh, for the past three years, has hosted what is called the LOCUS Link Up Program, which essentially is designed to bring triple bottom line, smart growth real estate developers and the local elected officials together to make more walkable urban places happen. And more importantly, uh, we are very interested in ex accelerating uh, the production of walkable urban places, and these webinars and our in-person link-ups are a way for us to achieve that. For those who, uh, who are not familiar with LOCUS, LOCUS is the national coalition of real estate developers who advocate for sustainable development um, throughout this country. Uh, many of you have, may have known uh, we have worked with programs like Transportation for America and Smart Group America to impact uh, transportation policy at the federal and state level, as well as right now leading a new coalition of developers who are trying to make changes in the tax reform to promote small scale and rehab development in a lot of our communities. Um, we also have a number of chapters across the country, uh, one in Massachusetts, Locust, Oregon, Michigan, Georgia, and many um, that are about to come online fairly soon. So again, if you're interested in learning more about Locus, please check out our website at locusdevelopers.org. Now with that, as I mentioned before, if you have any questions throughout this webinar, please tweet them at Locus Developers or type them into the chat box below. And with further ado, I would like to turn over to Brian Riley with the Partnership for uh, Greater Central Avenue to get us, get us started. Brian? Thanks for the introduction, Chris, and hello to all of you on today's webinar. What I'd like to do first, as a relative newcomer to Albuquerque, is to orient you as to our position in the new world. For hundreds of years, Albuquerque was a main stop along the Camino Real, Spanish for Royal Road, that connected Mexico City and Santa Fe. Next slide. So you can see the alignment here of Albuquerque and El Paso, of course, being on the contemporary U.S.-Mexico border. You can also see us being a six-hour drive today from Denver and Phoenix. Next slide. Forwarding to the present, people here like to acknowledge our roots and our uniqueness by saying of New Mexico, we're not new and we're not Mexico. But today, there's plenty of new that's about New Mexico from a national investment perspective, and much of it is centered in Albuquerque. Next slide. 
Albuquerque is growing. We're in the top eight U.S. states with real GDP growth this year. We're low risk compared to much of the rest of the U.S. regarding natural disasters. We're younger with a favorable ratio of 21 to 34-year-olds, smarter in the U.S. top 25 for college grads per capita, and diverse, reflecting today the racial and ethnic diversity that will characterize the entire U.S. by 2040. Next. What's also new about Albuquerque is the focus on transit-oriented development. We're in the midst of a two-year $800,000 TOD planning grant from the FTA that I'm managing for the city. It's focused on the future development we anticipate and the benefits we hope to share broadly from a focus on our Main Street, Central Avenue, and the 12,000 acres within walking distance of it through the heart of the city. The first year has been one of analysis and opportunity identification. Things like a study by Joe Minicozzi of Urban 3 to understand the underlying land productivity of the Central Corridor as compared to the rest of the city and the county. We'll use Urban 3's return on infrastructure investment concept to justify public expenditures to generate disproportional benefits from corridor investments. Given Albuquerque's persistently high poverty rates, these returns are linked to strategies that have been identified to reduce that percentage by 25%. The intention is to share the benefits of access to an improved transit system and other efficiencies that can result in an anticipated $1 billion of collective savings to households in the corridor. What's also new is our increasing connections to Smart Growth America. In 2017, Albuquerque was awarded a technical assistance grant by FTA to work with Smart Growth. That work will focus on, among other things, the relationship between corridor market demand and the implications for residential density. Next. Last year, our TOD planning grant invited John Anderson, new urbanist, co-founder of the Incremental Development Alliance, and until recently Albuquerque resident, to our convention center for an exercise whose outcomes have influenced our draft zoning code that's being rewritten for the entire city. In this exercise, diverse teams of planners, architects, developers, neighborhood association members, and active residents were charged each to develop a cash flowing, highest and best use pro forma for a specific property, first under the current and then under the draft zoning code. Teams learned a number of things. For example, our current code had excessive on site parking requirements that prevented pro formas from penciling. They also learned just how much it costs to make a project devote that much space to a car and how much money their project had to forego for asphalt rather than rentable or sellable real estate also revealed conflicting setback and height restrictions that were not only slowing development in general, but on some smaller parcels, they were precluding it entirely. Next. These and other collective lessons were codified in the draft zoning code through the planning grants more than 100 recommendations, about 80% of which have been accommodated. When adopted, the results should be a clear, predictable, by right development environment in the central corridor and beyond. Another analysis was conducted by the Center for Neighborhood Technology, estimating that the redevelopment potential of the 12,000 acres at $2.9 billion. The speed with which that's achieved, they predicted, will be directly related to the quality of the zoning changes and the quality of the transit improvements and connections. Optimally, that investment target could be reached in as little as 10 years. This week, I'm happy to report that Albuquerque is in the final stages of council approvals, for that revamp of its 40-year-old zoning code, update of its comp plan, and the design standards for public infrastructure citywide. Overall, our TOD outcomes depend on two levers. First, we're attempting to create places through the lever of land use regulations. We're also closing in on the completion of a second lever for our TOD work, connecting people, which involves a major transit investment about which you're going to hit more next. Next slide. Thank you, Brian. And now we'll turn it over to uh, Bruce, uh, who will speak about uh, the city and the region's uh, current effort in investing in public transportation. Bruce? Okay, Chris, thank you very much. Uh, next slide, please. All right, first, a one minute tour of the city. We're an average one mile high and 180 square miles. Mountains on the east, volcanoes on the west. Uh, the Rio Grande splits the city. Um, east to west, and I-25 north to south from Wyoming to southern New Mexico. 
Well, I-40 runs east to west from uh, Wilmington, North Carolina, to Barstow, California. Population of the city is 550,000 individuals, and the SMSA population is 850,000. Our main street is Central Avenue. It runs through the city from east to west and was the alignment of the fabled Route 66 from 1937 to 1985. It has always been and still remains our main public transit corridor. The other street is Louisiana Boulevard, which connects Central Avenue to a major office and retail complex named Uptown. Zooming in a little, 40% of all public transit uses Central Avenue. It connects all these places you see on the map. We are replacing the backbone of that service, what we call the rapid rides, with a new bus rapid transit system we call the Albuquerque Rapid Transit Project, or ARP, on a now nine-mile stretch of central from Coors on the west to Louisiana on the east. Off of either end, the ARP system will operate like a rapid transit. But there's no limit to the amount of flexibility in the service area for this service. It also connects to the Rail Runner commuter rail train, which operates from Albuquerque north to Santa Fe, 60 miles, and south to Berlin, another 60 miles, as well as connections to Rio Metro bus service from counties to the north and to the south. Art is a complex. Next slide. Next slide, please. Art is a complex bus rapid transit system. It has lanes down the middle, platforms in the middle, operated by battery electric buses, sidewalk improvements, improved to pedestrian lighting, landscaping. Um, it's a complete corridor and transit uh, redevelopment project. It also has a highly responsive signal system, including pedestrian walk signals. Next slide. Uptown is one of the most important places in the system connecting to the downtown area and to the west side. Next slide. Uptown is located in uh, close proximity to I-40. It sits almost in the center of what we call the Uptown area. It's a retail office district which, which contains two major shopping malls, Coronado and Windrock, and a lifestyle center called ABQ Uptown. Next slide. See? Next slide. These compromise, comprise rather over 2 million square feet of retail and are coupled with well over 2 million square feet of office of all sizes. Curiously, there are fewer than 1,500 residential units in this 390-acre area. Our immediate neighbor, neighbors are to the west, the headquarters of the Albuquerque Public Schools, a bar, bank, and business plaza to the north, the 10-story city place office building to the east, and to the south, the Nucinda Credit Union Building, and beyond it, the Park Square Complex. Next slide. Uptown has a very unusual worker dynamic. Very few people actually live and work in Uptown. Only about 500 out of 19,000 total workers. Next slide. Within a three-mile radius of our site, Almost 35,000 more people come into the area every day than go out. This is a marvelous transit opportunity. Uptown is already well served with bus routes, but the consistency of a bus rapid transit project makes us think that we can entice more people onto the bus, making vertical mixed-use development on our site a very tangible dream. Next slide. So here's the site. The site is 1.46 acres bordered by the Uptown Loop Road, Uptown Boulevard, and Indiana Street. The south half of the block is slightly larger in size. It is owned by Nucinda Credit Union, and a little bit more about that later. Next slide. With regard to only the part of the city, regard to only the part that the city owns, overall dimensions are 210 feet by 290 feet inside the rather large sidewalks required by the Uptown sector plan. Two thirds of the site is used for a park and ride. The southern third is the transit platform itself. We asked a local architectural firm and two local developers to look at what could be done with just that site that I described. They proposed four stories of residential, 
122 units over a commercial or retail floor plate with a parking structure. It would be possible to expand thinking about the project onto the whole site, including the CINDA tap, but I need to read something into the record. The CINDA is a private firm and their land holding is private. The city has no rights regarding the disposition of their property. Lucinda will participate in the request for proposal workshop to be scheduled by city purchasing, and it is requested that any interested parties wait until that workshop to contact Lucinda. With the full site engaged, the project as we envision it could have a millennium half and a boomer half, sharing on-site amenities and the parking structure. Parking structure would have to be at least would have to at least replace the service spaces lost. The boomer half of this proposal, the Nusinda site, has 68 units, roughly twice the size of the millennial units on the north end, and includes some three bedroom units. Next slide. And this is um, just an idea about the architectural style that could be developed on this piece of property. So let's go to some of the big issues. Um, first, number one, is that um, this site was bought and the transit platform constructed with funds from the Federal Transit Administration. So any development on this property must be in conformance with FTA's rules for assisted development project. Next slide. Okay, there you have the FTA requirements and the information on the right-hand side about, uh, about the site here. The use of the property must continue to include the transit use. The city must have continuing control over the actual ownership of the property, and the transit facility must continue to operate. And then third, the FTA must review the development agreement. Next slide. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, now we'll turn it over to our local developer, uh, David Blanc, for Principal Compost, uh, Compass Realty to talk about some of the uh, current market trends on the ground. Uh, David? Thank you, Christopher. Good afternoon. My name is David Blank. I'm the Executive Director of Central Millennium Partnership, a nonprofit development company for New Mexico, and also the principal of Compass Companies, an Albuquerque-based group that's pursued urban development opportunities since the late 80s. Next slide, please. Our purpose today is to inform our friends and colleagues in the area of impact lending in their advisory arena, one of the most visible community development opportunities which, in our opinion, could significantly change the city of Albuquerque's landscape and its quest to break the mold of traditional western transportation methods, conventional neighborhood housing, and Albuquerque's inert history to attract creative class employers. We're cognizant of the recent perception of Albuquerque's poor public safety, but we're also confident in the new leadership beginning in 2018 to correct these problems. With a younger, well-read, well-traveled leader for Albuquerque, we envision the city becoming a better place for greater entrepreneurship, technology enhancement, and future job growth. Our brief summary for this multi-stage TOD opportunity is centered around a town center neighborhood. Next slide, please. Originally known as Huning Highlands and identified along the Central Avenue corridor or the original Route 66 corridor. This area is re was rebranded in 2004 as East Downtown or Edo. Next slide, please. Over the, plan, over the past 10 years, we have assembled multiple properties, strategically introduced form-based codes to the city of Albuquerque for the Edo corridor and work to support more urban texture for the entire city. Next slide, please. We're fortunate that over the past few years, sizable redevelopments like Albuquerque High, the seven-acre public-private partnership for Innovate ABQ, have come to the Edo neighborhood. But the corridor and the surrounding historic neighborhood has also been enhanced with multiple partners from food service operations, yoga studios, hair salons, boutique hotels, and even some retail trade. In addition, the area has significant impact from the two largest hospital facilities and headquarters in the state of New Mexico. Next slide, please. Our goal at this point is to further this trend with a series of TOD projects to create 
create a sense of place in the center of a historic neighborhood, and along the first leg of Albuquerque's new rapid transit line, which is to the immediate east of Albuquerque's downtown. Our hope is to incorporate the goals of the neighborhood with greater housing density, which will support the demand for local commercial service centers and support the larger employment centers that are just a few minutes walk from the Edo Transit Station being completed just this week. Next slide, please. In order to effectively pursue this goal, it's imperative to have both trust of the establishment, including our neighborhood residents, and control of various properties that will allow a significant impact. Next slide, please. Currently, we control five of seven sites which comprise approximately 86,000 square feet of ground and immediately adjacent to the transit stop. With affordable parking solutions for incremental development on these sites, the support from the neighborhood for higher density living along the transit corridor and the addition of neighborhood services within these mixed-use structures that we intend to build, we believe the project could be in a sense of a, can bring a sense of community not previously seen in Albuquerque neighborhoods in the past 50 years. Next slide, please. With an additional support or the support from successful existing mixed-use buildings like 600 Central and the Grove Cafe and other retail services, we can double down on this opportunity by giving other less centralized transit stops in various parts of Albuquerque a clear sense of opportunity provided by TODs. First, it's important to know that Albuquerque has a good reputation from end lenders placing permanent financing on a variety of new and existing real properties. Basically, volatility in the marketplace has been identified and described as advantageous in light of the smaller Albuquerque population and has, and has historically had less value, value volatility with its fairly conservative local lending practices. Well, of course, that can be a double-edged sword, as we all know, since conservative lending practices also mean that this is a place where mainstream lending is dominant and subjective or mission investing is not readily supported. Albuquerque has struggled with this issue for many years and has only recently attracted national attention during the vast multifamily housing boom and a few mixed-use developers entering the marketplace. Additionally, for well-financed groups, local recourse financing projects is still standard and negotiated limited guarantees for projects with permanent financing commitments is available, but to fewer parties. This practice also doesn't help creating the additional synergy with new incremental housing in the neighborhoods themselves surrounding these major corridor projects. Finally, there are minor civic challenges that any multifaceted development in the city faces. First is the city finishing what they themselves have started. Next slide, please. Like the transit system and the city's commitment to finalize simple shade canopies. Next slide, please. The Edo station, whose design is unfinished, is going to have a canopy, but we don't know exactly what. Next slide, please. Or the concept we introduced years ago for, years ago for park it parking adjacent to the commercial corridor, which approvals have gotten tangled up in the corridor project itself. Finally, the important elements of building a wayfinding method in the area to make public aware of the available business access, transit, and parking, which has all changed because of the new street. I think we're missing a slide, but let's go to the next slide, please. We were fortunate to convince city engineers recently to lowering the speed of car traffic so as to encourage a more safe pedestrian bike travel along the new street design. Next slide. Our expectation for developing these sites over the past 30 months has changed from high density, high land area use and coverage to mostly high density and lower land use to protect the adjacent neighborhood features. Next slide, please. Fortunately, with the creation of the East Downtown Master Plan we helped foster through the city in 2005, the pre-2005 guidelines to limitations imposed by the National Register for intense oversight along this corridor 
has been replaced with a new urban conservation overlay zone. That UCAUSE was also the first form-based code in the city of Albuquerque, which has helped lead the way to the new IDO that you heard about earlier and replacing that Euclidean style zoning that the city has had for almost 70 years. Originally purchased the name and named town center land in 2001, these properties have always been considered best location for five and six story mixed use development properties. Can we go back one slide, please? Together with the pre-planning for the sister sites, we can create a transit corridor wall of buildings with 200 plus residential units, commercial services and parking in the immediate area of this transit stop. Without much additional detail, let me say that we now visualize with the Albuquerque transit system being incorporated, an opportunity to create more urban living environments to support the growing demand for our young and industrious population. We invite your commentary, advisory recommendations, and potential for a comprehensive partnership with the help of our assets and our local experience. Thank you for making the time today. Next slide. Thank you, David. Um, and with that, I'd like to turn it back over to Brian Riley to talk a little bit more about what the city is doing to uh, accelerate the entitlement process, and also perhaps give us a sneak peek at an upcoming RFP of TOD projects that are coming down the pipeline. Brian? Thanks, Chris. A couple more TOD development opportunities. Next slide, please. First, Old Town, which is the historic heart of Albuquerque with a rich mix of historic buildings, local shops, and cultural institutions. Next slide, please. Located here. Next slide. Plaza Vieja, Old Town's formal and picturesque public square, is currently not visible from Central Avenue. The city-owned public parking lot separates our founding plaza from the new transit station on the city's most traveled main street. This parking lot represents a key infill opportunity to provide a front door entry to Old Town. Next slide, please. This condition and others were thoroughly examined as part of a week-long charrette earlier this year, led by planning firms, placemakers, Duane Plater Zybeck, and a team of others. That charrette work has been compiled into a corridor plan that's being vetted now with station area communities. It's anticipated to be formulated into a TOD chapter of the city's Rank 2 Route 66 action plan. Next slide. The illustrative plan for Old Town shows the tree-lined Plaza Vieja here an approximately two acre surface parking lot that today fronts central, but has the potential for new infill composed of shops, retail, restaurants, and residences. Plans call for a more direct and celebrated connection between central and the plaza that could be pedestrian or vehicular, such as a shared space street double lined with arcaded buildings. Next slide, please. Nearby and adjacent streets, such as Romero Street at the plaza shown here, are recommended for a wider and tree-lined sidewalk that can help refresh the Old Town brand as a people place with space for pedestrians, street vendors, and events. Next slide, please. Most of the properties on the other side of Central from Old Town are also underdeveloped, providing the opportunity to create a larger and newly branded district supporting Old Town, reinforced with needed housing and physical connections around the next art station at Rio Grande. Next slide. Old Town is an international attraction because of its historic significance and timeless charm. The city is very willing to discuss possible infill redevelopment and creative parking replacement or shared solutions serving nearby uses with the goal of rebranding and refreshing this cultural core of the city. Also, we'd like to see a more formal connection between the transit station and the historic plaza that connects transit to downtown Edo and the rest of the city. Next slide, please. On the west side, the Charette's public outreach and engagement revealed a community aspiration for a sense of place, strong center, and meaningful locations for community events in a part of the city that's largely Hispanic and more conventionally suburban in form. Next slide, please. Located here, west of the river. Next slide. Around the intersection of Coors and Central are many acres of vacant and underutilized land, which present an opportunity to reimagine the heart of West Central Albuquerque. Today, from the Coors Transit Station, few destinations are walkable and fewer from the surrounding neighborhoods. Next. 
The plan recommends an urban plaza at this intersection framed by retail and commercial buildings that define a focal point, a green roundabout through which art traverses with Route 66 themed gateway sculptures and neon signage. Next slide. The second recommendation is a large public square evoking Old Towns Plaza to serve as a focal center for community culture, a formal gathering place for festivals, growers markets, and other events. Fronting the square could be finer grain development opportunities around a community resource center, daycare, and other services with live work units and small retail spaces for local business. Such a plaza could be the first move to activate a very large and currently underutilized area. Next. A recent market study shows little demand for new retail around West Central, so a significant increase in housing is necessary. The large vacant acreage is also adjacent to a Verizon call center, and a second large format job center has long been desired by community leaders. A recent RFP for city-owned land near the final art station, just west of Coors, may generate new energy and showcase redevelopment formats complementary of those envisioned around Coors. So Albuquerque's Western Gateway could provide a national developer a unique opportunity to build on community desires as a reimagining of what is possible for a large-scale suburban retrofit with some assembly with willing property owners. Next slide, please. So with any of the TOD redevelopment opportunities you've seen, or any site in Albuquerque, we have a helpful tool called Zonar. It's an entitlement modeling software into which the entire draft zoning code has been loaded, and the program allows a very quick visualization of a property's entitlements. The output is a massing scheme that shows the maximum allowable buildable area, accounting for setbacks, height limitations, et cetera. And the really compelling piece for developers is the ability to calculate how different uses fit into the buildable area through a capacity analysis. Next slide. That analysis visualizes parking requirements, including how different parking arrangements can be laid out, whether surface or structured, and it incorporates density and use size limits and plugs it all into the massing scheme visualized here. In this way, a developer can quickly measure the potential of a site in terms of how many parking spaces can be accommodated, the amount of commercial retail and or office space that can be developed, and how many dwelling units can be developed and at what average size. In minutes, the maximum allowable buildable area of a site can be visualized and then shown to decision makers, stakeholders or tenants, or loan officers. These analyses show the developable area by right and also the limitations of a site, especially true for parking. So users can quickly adjust their use mix to reveal maximum efficiencies. The city's permitting shop is looking into using Zonar with its plan review staff to transform a task that took two to three weeks of total time into one that only takes two to three hours. And in this way, we hope to streamline permitting in the central corridor. And ideally, once implemented, the system will allow the developer to, to model their project in Zonar and their design file can be submitted back to permitting for quick review and approval. Next slide, please. Throughout the corridor, people are talking with people they don't normally talk with. Next slide. Each of the station area communities are inviting residents, businesses, and others to come to what we call Action Forum to see how they can literally shape the future of their parts of the corridor. They're starting by discussing the draft chapters of the Charette document. Next slide. On November 18th, those who participate in the community level meetings, along with the entire population, are being invited to a citywide summit at the convention center in which everyone will consider how they each want to shape the future of urban Albuquerque. This summit was an outgrowth of a unique mayoral candidate forum a couple of months ago, organized by a group called Urban ABQ, and it engaged all candidates in a real dialogue, not a debate or a stale campaign Q&A on urban issues such as transportation and mobility, local economic development, public health and poverty, and more. Next slide. As action-oriented conversations progress, they'll be aided by a series of technical working groups staffed by local government departments and agencies on topics such as infrastructure, funding, financing, local job linkages, and the like, with the aim of operationalizing the future of the corridor by embedding all of this into how local government works and works with its people and businesses. Supporting these conversations will be a cohort of community fellows from each station area community nominated by their fellow citizens and residents. 
They'll serve as two-way translators between city TOD technical staff and the residents of the neighborhoods they live in. Together, station area communities will aspire to a neighborhood-based placemaking project later this spring as a first step to advance their local TOD priorities and grow the circle of people participating in realizing these improvements. In this way, we'll sow the seeds for a local culture of placemaking toward real-world TOD outcomes. Next slide, please. And we're building on some pretty good placemaking chops here in Albuquerque, such as Downtown Main Street Program's collaboration last year with the Project for Public Spaces. With a Southwest Airlines grant, they activated one of the most challenging public spaces in America, our Civic Plaza, into a power of 10 people place that offered 10 reasons for 10 different kinds of people to come spend time and enjoy themselves. Next slide. All of this place-based work and community organizing anticipated to add hundreds of new participants to the more than 1,000 who have already been active so far. And every one of them has a stake in the core of the city. And together, they will be the partnership for a greater Central Avenue. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Um, at this time, if you have any questions, please take advantage of our chat box, which is at your lower uh, left-hand corner, or uh, tweet us at Locust Developers. Um, with that, our first question goes to Bruce. Bruce, can you give us a, a, a little more clarity on the projected date of completion for the BRT project? We should um, have, we're about 80% through the construction period right now. And we think we'll be through the punch list uh, a little later than March of 2018. Uh, we have plans to start some limited service um, by the end of the calendar year. Thank you. Um, this question goes to Brian. Brian, you spent a lot of time discussing how the city and the region was re, uh, reforming its entitlement process. Could you give an example of how long it would take, or an example of a project, how long did it take to get through your current entitlement process? Well, two to three uh, weeks was the permitting estimate. Um, and projects now really, it depends on where you are and how many layers of sector plans and other requirements you need to go through. So there are about 700 individual plans and layers now. The zoning code uh, redo is attempting to get those down to less than 30 layers. Um, council uh, took the first steps for that approval process on Monday. We think it may be approved by the end of the year. So we are really looking at uh, tweaking that zoning code to get to a buy right environment. Um, and that's the goal. Okay, thank you, Brian. Uh, the next question is regarding your current outreach uh, efforts. Uh, to what extent can you describe previous uh, engagement with the community in terms of the design uh, of the neighborhood, as well as are you, will you be doing an additional private sector outreach uh, during the upcoming summit uh, that is uh, currently planned? We're using that action forum process as a way for people to decide what they care about and invite others to talk about it um, and take action. Um, and we're finding that individuals and businesses, business owners, um, are coming together and having conversations they normally wouldn't have. That's happening on both scales at the neighborhood level, uh, starting by reacting to the Charette document, um, but it's also happening on November 18th, as you heard, at a citywide scale. And I think there are some corridor-wide issues that folks are anticipating uh, to have conversations about from different neighborhoods. So we're looking at a corridor-wide tax increment district, very complex, but there's, there's support in many of the individual neighborhoods, and those folks are organizing to come together to start a corridor-wide conversation. There may be other policies that uh, businesses and, and residents are coming together to advocate for with the new administration. Um, and as part of these various plans, the Integrated Development Ordinance, the Zoning Code, this, this quarter plan. So we're trying to align all the policies and regulations based on these conversations. And folks are helping us uh, sharpen that and get that right. 
Great. Um, that's actually uh, folds right into the next question, and this can go to either Brian or Bruce. Uh, to the extent, uh, as part of the planning process for the BRT corridor and the zoning changes uh, that are currently being discussed, to what extent is Albuquerque either A, have made changes to their parking requirements, both for residential and commercial along the corridor, or are <laughs> currently contemplating those parking requirements? Um, one of our big outcomes of the John Anderson workshop, as we call it, was a clearer understanding of the parking requirements as they existed. That was over a year ago. Um, and we, we definitely learned that we were requiring more parking than would allow a project to pencil. And so those changes have been advocated for and made in the draft IDO, um, particularly in the urban neighborhoods, right? We have a mix of uh, different forms, right? Urban, suburban, but we really did focus on parking and how it related to enabling development and making sure that they weren't excessive um, and not allowing projects to pencil. I'm also going to allow David to maybe, from his personal experience as a developer, to talk about that too, because he's following that very closely. Christopher, you know, with regard to your, uh, your question, I think that, number one, there are additional changes being made. But in addition to um, what Brian mentioned, I will also say that historically there's been a parking credit provided to many developers of larger projects for mixed-use projects and being located on transit corridors. So I only see the influence of these larger projects um, having a, a better opportunity to pencil out over the next year or two as we're finding out right now with the size projects that we're doing so that Parking is accommodated, the neighborhoods are satisfied, and basically, in many ways, we help the city push our residents to more public transit use. Uh, thank you, as, and just as a follow-up, uh, Brian, could you talk a little bit more about the kind of the criteria you use to estimate the number of parking spaces as part of that John uh, Anderson, who is a dear friend, uh, workshop? <laughs> Well, um, after John got done um, beating us, no, really, those teams that got together, right, the designers, the architects, the residents, the conversations that happened when they all had to make a pro forma work together resulted in them seeing just how uh, the parking requirements were preventing projects from penciling. Um, so we really, I guess the criteria we used was, does it allow highest and best use to be achieved on that site. Um, a lot of folks didn't realize where money came from and where it was bleeding in a project, and, and many times it was excess asphalt required by our code. And you know, our code was done at a time when you know, the suburban standards really were the, the shape of it, and it was applied citywide. It's time to update that and calibrate it to the different forms that we have in our city. And in the urban core, like Edo and Old Town, downtown, um, those, those examples of different sites from those different parts of the, the community allowed us to see what the numbers resulted in. And therefore, if it didn't allow a project to pencil, uh, we changed it. Thank you. Um, this is, uh, could go to both David and to Brian. Uh, can you describe in a little more detail, besides the uh, potential uh, TIF district that may be uh, created along the corridor, what other public incentives are being put in place or are being currently used to encourage development along the corridor that, are, that could be available for uh, potential uh, developers or investors in the, in, in, on this call? One of the things that we're doing on the public infrastructure side is trying to understand the, uh, the uh, possibility for shared services such as district parking. Um, stormwater is an issue that is better treated area-wide than parcel by parcel. And so these kinds of infrastructure questions are things that our technical working groups are going to take on and figure out how to make the, uh, the impact to any one property less and get some value by uh, collective solutions. That would be one approach we're taking um, in addition to the buy right environment, which should make it much clearer about the kind of development we want to see in each area and the path forward to getting uh, permits. In addition to that, Christopher, I think it's important to recognize that 
you know, in Albuquerque, we have a lot of different neighborhoods that in one way or another uh, feel affected by development along these commercial corridors and transit areas. And so I think one of the things that the IDO or the Integrated Development Ordinance is going to provide is a more formal understanding between all the parties. Um, I think the parking issue is a primary concern and uh, that's our focus as a developer in trying to address size and mass of projects. Um, which is why in the Edo area, we're now looking at having to go back to the city to increase the height requirements of some of these buildings so that we can uh, increase the parking potential on site and adjacent to these buildings instead of, you know, impacting the sites individually with as much building as possible. Trying to keep our costs down, having the city recognize the need for parking, but at the same time, allowing us the opportunity to take advantage of that public infrastructure that's being built along the corridor to assist the neighborhood in satisfying the parking needs. You know, one more thing, Christopher. Uh, our Municipal Redevelopment Authority has the ability to contribute to general infrastructure, land assembly. There are a number of redevelopment areas along the central corridor um, where they're also able to do things like land write-downs. Um, and this might be particularly applicable to a lot of the old motel sites that are vacant or underutilized. Um, they're a little challenging, uh, and this is where our MRA might be able to uh, contribute things like MR bonds, um, tax abatements. And so we'd want to work with somebody uh, early on. We didn't talk about the area of Upper Knob Hill, uh, but that is an area where there are lots of uh, vacant former Route 66 sites that have been cleared that we think are uh, midterm opportunities with a little bit of work and we're very willing to talk to folks about those. Um, this question is to uh, Brian and David. Uh, this is a, uh, what has been considered the former historic Route 66. Um, to what extent is it currently a historic district in place and to what extent has the uh, State Historic Preservation Office uh, been an ally or not an ally as you redevelop this corridor, this historic corridor? Yeah. This is a Bruce. Um, the Central Avenue itself is not considered to be a historic area. The city does have uh, some historic areas in the Old Town area and up in the Union Highland area. Um, there's some overlay zones where you are required to abide by some uh, historical uh, architectural styles. The Edo area, there's a Landmarks uh, Commission, which for some um, street furniture and other aspects like that, you have to go through them for some approval, which we got our Walter Station approved through that process. Um, but the rest of Central Avenue is, is a road. It's, quote, historic, because it was Route 66 until that got de-designated but historically, it's, it's not a district itself. Uh, SHPO, uh, we've worked with them on the ART project. Um, that's the reason why three of the 19 stations at now won't have any canopies, because they felt that there'd be visual um, blight introduced into the, into the area. Um, so once the project is completed, we'll get back and try to figure out how to provide some canopies which also allows, from their point of view, better visual um, viewing from one side of the street to the other side of the street. Thank you, Bruce. And really quickly, Bruce, while I have you, you had mentioned earlier uh, that uh, the current BRT project is about 80% uh, complete. Could you just uh, repeat the expected date or year of completion? Uh, we feel that full completion of the construction, punch list items, et cetera, be in the first quarter of calendar year 2018, and we'll start some limited service by the end of this calendar year. Thank you. Um, and to Brian, you mentioned that uh, the currently the city is uh, uh, putting together a RFP. Uh, is there a targeted date where that RFP would be available for those on this call and others uh, to review, and where would it be uh, listed? Uh, what we're asking folks to do who are, might be interested in that RFP is to send an email so we can put you on purchasing's list and you will be notified uh, when that RFP is issued. 
Okay. Um, and with that, uh, we have uh, reached uh, the end of our questions. Uh, so as we stated before, um, it, for those who are on this call, this webinar has been broadcast, uh, has been recorded, and will be made available immediately after the webinar. Uh, in addition to that, if you look, you're interested in more information about Albuquerque and the work that Smart Group America is doing in Albuquerque, please visit our website at smartgroupamerica.org forward slash locus. But more importantly, I would like to thank uh, both Brian, uh, Bruce, and David for being great panelists, really giving us a great insight by uh, some of the unique opportunities for development in Albuquerque. And so with that, uh, we thank you all for participating and joining this call, and we look forward to seeing you in Albuquerque doing a deal. Thanks again, and we'll talk soon.